and that started. And so, all, so where science fiction writers had each been writing their own, science, you know, um, uh, space exploration stories and time travel stories and parallel world stories, and you know, uh, experiments gone gone awry and dystopian stories. And Heinlein coined that as sort of, you know, if this goes on, <laughs> if if things escalate. But now they became after the bomb stories, and all the science fiction writers were writing them. So here's one that I think is particularly. Got it, got it. It's by Robert Moore Williams, and it's called The Day They H-Bomb Los Angeles. <laughs> so that's pretty great. And, of course, one of the greatest after-bomb stories is Canticle for Leibowitz, which is a wonderful book by um, Walter M. Miller. Now, these writers were um, also uh, writing things based on their war experience, because Walter M. Miller had been in World War II and had uh, destroyed a monastery in Germany, uh, and felt great guilt over that. So the devastation that he wrote about and, and the religious um, monastery trying to survive after Doomsday was sort of him processing the events that had happened to him uh, in World War II. Uh, but, so we had these wonderful after the bomb stories and, uh, and, they, and thank God we didn't actually have that happen in real life so far. But, um, but they were very interesting and, and many of them were very, very fun to read and very interesting to read. And John Wyndham wrote one as well. And many of these writers did. So now, I also want to mention some writers who um, I didn't mention last time, or I mentioned only in, in passing, and kind of just wanted to give a shout out for them before we move to the later decades. So, for instance, here is Andre Norton. Now, Andre Norton was a female writer. Her, her real name was Alice, and uh, Alice Norton, and she um, she was writing science fiction, and she wrote some adult novels. But she actually, her, her main claim to fame, or her her greatest. Uh, notice was in juvenile fiction and she was in the libraries of all the elementary schools etc when I was a kid along with Heinlein so I I was never as fond of her work as of Heinlein's but many people grew up with her work and really love it uh, there were other writers writing science fiction sort of tangentially like Madeleine Lengel with uh, A Wrinkle in Time in the early 60s and beyond but that was kind of a strange mix of uh, religious writing and science fiction and fantasy kind of a very strange um, combination and uh, so kind of on the cusp. And then we've also talked about science fiction that was being written by non-science fiction writers, and we'll get into that a little bit more too. Um, and then, of course, each year, by now here in the 50s and 60s, we were having the World Science Fiction Conventions. They were giving out the Hugos for Best Short Story, Best Novella, Best Novelette, and Best Novel. Now, many of these novels are still famous, still being actively read, while others, uh, no one really remembers them, or very few people. And so here's one of the ones, this one, Best Novel, in the 50s, it was called The Forever Machine. And it's uh, by Mark Clifton and Frank Riley. And I have not yet read it, but perhaps I will at some point. And uh, it has a really cool cover by Wally Wood, who again was the artist who did that great cover of EC Comics I showed you a moment ago. And so, um, but that one was forgotten. But here's some other writers from the 50s who were really good and, uh, and should, you know, they're worth checking out. So here's um, Frederick Pohl and C.M. Cornbluth. And, uh, and C.M. Cornbluth also wrote with Judith Merrill under the pseudonym Cyril Judd. Judith Merrill was well known as an editor, a science fiction editor. But uh, Frederick Pohl was also a very well known writer, won a lot of Hugos, and also was a very, very esteemed editor of both science fiction magazines and, and, and science fiction collections. And of course, the great thing is that because science fiction, you can make a name for yourself writing short stories in science fiction, uh, the magazines were very important, and, and then uh, the anthologies that gathered those stories together were, uh, were also very important in popularizing these writers. And, um, and as I mentioned, some science fiction writers write, write, also wrote mystery. And every now and then, a mystery writer would also write science fiction. So John D. MacDonald, who was a very, very, very good mystery writer that I highly recommend, he wrote this science fiction novel called Planet of the Dreamers. And it's fun because the, uh, the astronaut has his uh, visor up and he's smoking a cigarette. So that's really a fun illustration. And um, I mentioned Arthur Clarke uh, last time. And this is a fun little side piece of information. This is a... Uh, one of his books from the 50s, Islands in the Sky, about a space station. And if you visited his home in Sri Lanka, he would go to his bookcase and he would give you a book from his library. And so this says on, this, on the inner uh, cover, it's stamped Sir Arthur C. Clarke, CBE. That's, you know, an order of the whatever it is, British thing. Uh, and it's number 25, Barnes Place, Colombo 7, Sri Lanka. And uh, you know this is bad, of course when he was still with us he's no longer sadly with us but and then and then what he would do is he would autograph the book and so here it is it's there's Arthur C Clarke's autograph guys isn't that fun and so uh, so this is another of my prized 
um, items in my collection. So, an, so another great writer was Frederick Brown. Another he he wrote mysteries such as the Screaming Mimi and the Fabulous Clip Joint, and he also and he also wrote science fiction space on my hands. He was also a science fiction editor, and uh, and. And, um, and then one time he combined science fiction and mystery, where he wrote a book called Rocket to the Morgue that was a mystery, and, it, and he, he had all the science fiction writers he knew as characters renaming them under different, you know, pseudonyms, but it was very fun, and I'm sure the writers and the fans knew who everybody was in that book. So, and as I, I mentioned also that there were some writers who were coming to prominence in England and then being published here as well. Arthur C. Clarke was the m most significant, but there was also John Wyndham, and this is Revolt of the Triffids, which is also known as Day of the Triffids, and we'll talk more about that um, when we get to the um, film section of our little history of science fiction. And I talked about Isaac Asimov uh, a bit, and Isaac Asimov, you know, came to prominence in the 50s, wrote something like 300 books, something crazy, and uh, that's what he looked like. That's the special issue of the magazine Fantasy and Science Fiction on, um, on Isaac Asimov. That's a cover by Ed M. Schwiller, whose work I very much love. And uh, here's some more of, of Asimov's books, The End of Eternity, and uh, here you can check that out. It's a fun cover. I think that's probably Richard Powers, another great science fiction artist. And... Uh, and The Naked Sun. I showed you last time the hardcover first edition of that. This is Frank Kelly Freeze, a wonderful Kelly Freeze cover. And, uh, and, then, and then probably one of, one of uh, Isaac Asimov's primary science fiction contributions, the one he's really known for, as well as The Caves of Steel and I, Robot and so forth. Because he, he came up with the three laws of robotics, by the way, which uh, a lot of science fiction writers use. And um, but he also wrote Foundation, and this is this is actually the paperback edition of Foundation from the from the fifties, and you can see it's a goofy cover, and they retitled it the Thousand Year Plan. But it was actually a trilogy called Foundation, <coughs> uh, Second Foundation, and Foundation and Empire. And so this is the the uh, paperback of the first novel, and then he did uh, another Foundation book or one or two more afterwards. Uh, but you know, but <coughs> very fun, and that's very galaxy spanning, long time frame, etc. And uh, and they talk. They 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 did a really good radio adaptation of it for the BBC, and they keep talking about doing it as a TV show or a movie, and that's supposedly in the works. We'll see. We'll see what happens. But um, <clears throat> you know. But so far so good. Now also, by the way, we talked about definitions definitions of science fiction. Uh, Damon Knight, who was one of my teachers and an editor, and writer, he wrote to Serve Man, that was made into a Twilight Zone story, a uh, Twilight Zone episode. His definition of science fiction was, science fiction is what I'm pointing at when I say science fiction. Uh, my definition of science fiction is <clears throat> that uh, science fiction is a story uh, in which the fantasy elements are explained by a scientific or pseudoscientific explanation. In, in which the fantastic element is is defined by a scientific or pseudoscientific explanation. So, in other words, uh, you know, Arthur C. Clarke said that any advanced technology would be in, um, indistinguishable from magic, and he's right. But if you say, "Oh, well, this is how this works. Let this uses neutrinos or whatever," then it's like, "Oh, okay, it uses neutrinos," or you know, "This is how we get invisibility," or "This is how we get um, anti gravity," or time travel. You know, you come up with something that sounds plausible. Maybe it's derived from science, or maybe it's an extrapolation. Whereas in fantasy, you don't. It's just like it's magic, and then you're off and running. Or in my own magic time novels, at first it's magic, but then we find a, a pseudo-scientific explanation for it. So that, so in a way, my magic time novels really are science fiction rather than fantasy, but, um, but you can check them out yourself and uh, see what you think. Now, I also mentioned last time the great Theodore Sturgeon. This is one of his well-known novels, um, uh, More Than Human, with a, another great Richard Powers cover, which is just very, very nice. And... Um, and you know, so and and I urge, I recommend that. This is um, Clifford D. Simak, a really wonderful robot. I mean, robots were always a great fun thing in science fiction. I wouldn't mind building something that looks like that. It's really cool. And he also wrote Way Station, which won the Hugo for best novel. And uh, he's a very good writer. And uh, I, I really love City. It's a great. It's a it's a collection of short stories after man has left Earth and Earth is populated by robots and. Um, dogs that have been adapted to have human level intelligence. It's really fun. And um, now also we talked about parallel worlds. 
And Murray Leinster, as I said, wrote Sidewise in Time, but then a lot of writers were often running with parallel world stories because they're so fun. And I mentioned last time that Man in the High Castle was written by Philip K. Dick. It's now a TV show, but it actually won the Hugo in the early 60s. Now, a lot of people think of Philip K. Dick as sort of this pot-bellied guy with gray hair, kind of a receding hairline and this gray mustache and beard. And that's the sort of the later Philip K. Dick, uh, around when Blade Runner was being shot, just before he passed away. And of course, he, you know, but, but this is the young Philip K. Dick when he wrote Man of the High Castle. And I love this photo by Arthur Knight. And uh, you just can get a sense of this, this young man's intellect and drive and he's, you know, just, I mean, if you saw this guy in person, you would want to talk to him because he's just in amazingly um, interesting looking. And um, so, uh, but this is a story in which the Nazis win World War II. Now, uh, there are other stories of that. Uh, Fatherland, of course, is one by Robert Harris, not a science fiction writer, but it posits an alternative history where the Nazis won. There's also SSGB by Len Dayton or Dighton, and that's in here somewhere in the stack of books, and we'll get to that. But again, not a science fiction writer, primarily a, a, an espionage writer, British, but, um, but that's recently been made, been made into a TV series and, um, again, deals with if, if uh, England had lost the war and the Nazis occupied England, and um, it's a very fun book. I mean, I'm, I'm a fan of, of Nazis won the war stories, and uh, um, these are very good ones. Man, I recommend man, the novels, Man, man in the High Castle, Fatherland, and, uh, and SSGB. SSGB stands for SS Great Britain. And uh, so another writer who rose to prominence in the 50s, and again, this, was primar this, this writer was primarily a um, fantasy writer, and, and, uh, but he would dabble in science fiction, and, and this, his name was Char Charles Beaumont, and he was one of the Ray Bradbury's protégés, and he, his main uh, thing he's known for now, as uh, his fame, is that he was one of the primary writers on Twilight Zone. And again, when we get to the television section of this history of science fiction, we'll talk more about Beaumont and Matheson and so forth. Uh, another writer who is really, really good is um, Alfred Bester, and he wrote two novels that are considered great science fiction novels, The Star is My Destination and um, The Demolished Man. And if the name Alfred Bester seems familiar, it's because Joe Straczynski created a character named Bester in Babylon 5 that Walter Koenig played, and it was named after Alfred Bester. And additionally, uh, when we talk about the sad puppies, um, uh, there was an award that the George R. R. Martin gave out called the uh, the Alfie Awards, again named after Alfred Bester. Now we talked a little bit about A. E. Van Vogt, who was another science fiction writer, and he was again part of this L.A. crowd. They all knew each other. They all hung out. They all went to each other's parties. And when L. Ron Hubbard uh, went from being a science fiction writer to founding Dianetics and then Scientology, some of the science fiction writers dabbled in it. Uh, Forrest Ackerman, A. E. Van Vogt, and uh, John W. Campbell dabbled in it, whereas others like Ted Sturgeon just thought it was just you know, a crock. <laughs> and Ted told me about that because he was at the party when Hubbard said he had an idea for a novel and someone said, well, if you um, create a, a religion based on that instead of a, a, a selling it for $1,000 as a science fiction novel, you'll never have to work again. So uh, Ted was at that party. He told me about it. So um, so this is A.E. Van Vogt's work, Operation Universe, uh, another fun cover. If you can see it, let me see it. Get, get the glare off it a little bit. Very fun. The Weapon Shops of Isher is another Van Vogt book. And uh, we talked earlier about Slan, which is a very famous um, novel by uh, A.E. Van Vogt about a, a human being with um, superhuman tele you know, uh, telepathic, telekinetic powers, all of that. This is the, uh, the first printing. There it is. And it's dedicated to E. Main Hull, who is his wife and another science fiction writer herself. So this, is a, this was a very influential book. And it talks about these kind of outsiders who are, who are superior to regular humans. And so a lot of science fiction fans who were outsiders and felt superior to other humans identified with, with, with the character in this book. Um, now, another writer that I just mentioned a moment ago who rose to prominence in the 50s and became a very famous writer was Richard Matheson. Now, Richard Matheson was a huge influence on... Um, on Stephen King because Matheson was writing horror that was set in the everyday world. It wasn't set in some castle like, Dra like Dracula or it wasn't in Europe. It was here. The horror could be here. And Matheson often would sort of make the main character himself in one way or another, base it on himself. And so his work was very, very realistic. And sometimes he'd write things that were ghost stories or horror stories. Here's A Stir of Echoes. That's one of his books from the 50s. And, but he would also end and ride The Nightmare, which is kind of a thriller. And you can see that. That's another first edition. Um, but he would also write science, and, and he would write science fiction. And here's three of his great science fiction novels. And he was also writing 
books and movies and TV shows. And like, because again, he was a protege of Ray Bradbury, and Ray was writing novels, short stories, writing for radio, writing for television, writing for movies. And this, of course, inspired me as well, which is why I write for television, movies, and, uh, and, and books. And I've written for radio as well. And now I'm writing comic books, too, with the Space Command comic. So, but, but science fiction. So, so Matheson wrote The Shrinking Man, and this is the first edition of The Shrinking Man. It's about a guy who shrinks because he's exposed to atomic fallout. And it's a, it was an amazing novel, not like anything else that was written by anybody. And it's science fiction, but also has elements of horror. And um, it was made into a movie, and we'll talk about that when we get to the movie section. And uh, he also wrote, this also came out in the 50s. This is I Am Legend. That's the first edition. Many of these books came out in paperback. First editions only came out in hardcover later. Uh, many years later sometimes, like with Vonnegut and with Matheson. And this is the first edition signed. These are all signed by Matheson to me because I wrote The Twilight Zone Companion and got to know Matheson personally. He was an amazing guy, a wonderful guy. And uh, it's funny because, again, like with Philip K. Dick, people mainly know him as sort of this bearded, older man, kind of serious looking, though he had a great sense of humor, but he had piercing blue eyes. And when he was young, people actually uh, thought he looked a lot like Paul Newman. And so this is what he looked like when he was, when he was young. And you can't really, really get it as much in black and white, but if you imagine him as having these incredibly bright blue eyes and blondish hair, you can really sort of imagine, the, you can really see the, the uh, resemblance to Paul Newman, who was a very famous movie star of the 1960s and 70s. And, um, so, and then, of course, Matheson wrote Bid Time Return, now, now, so I Am Legend, by the way, is about the last man on Earth, and a disease has taken over everyone else and turned them into essentially vampires. So it's a, it, Matheson was mixing up genres uh, often, and so he really wanted to combine the horror and the science fiction genres. And so this is sort of an end of the world novel, and it was made in. It's been made into three versions: uh, Last Man on Earth, starring Vincent Price in the '60s; uh, The Omega Man, starring Charlton Heston in the '70s; and I Am Legend, starring Will Smith, more recently. And so I believe in the '90s. And um, but uh, but the but the book is very very good, and you can read read it in you know on Kindle or or buy it as a physical book or listen to it on audio. And I recommend it. It's a really really cool book. And the it, it's interesting because uh, I Am Legend initially had a different ending, which is much closer to the novel. And uh, and then it didn't test well supposedly, and they recut the movie and reshot the ending. But I actually prefer the first version of I Am Legend, the movie with Will, Will Smith. So you can check that out too. And then finally, he's also well known for this. This is. This is the first paperback co edition of Bid Time Return, which you would probably know better as Somewhere in Time. And it's a time travel story, and, uh, and it was made into a very famous movie uh, starring Christopher Reeve and Jane Alexander, and I recommend it if you haven't seen it. And, uh, and it's very touching, and, it, um, and, and Matheson was friends with Jack Finney, who wrote Time After Time, which was a time travel story, and also wrote The Body Snatchers, which became Invasion of the Body Snatchers. And so in, as a little tip of the hat in uh, Somewhere in Time slash Bid Time Return, Matheson had a Professor Finney talk about time travel. And, uh, and that was because, you know, Finney had gone before Matheson in terms of writing time travel stories. So, so these are some of Matheson's great, great works. And um, so now there, another writer who is worth checking out is Algis Budras, who wrote Rogue Moon, and many other short stories and novels. And, uh, and I mentioned the EC comics that were adapting Ray Bradbury's stories. And in the 60s, I was homesick one day as a kid, and my mom bought me this book, which was, and I'd never heard of EC comics. I didn't know anything about it. And these are adaptations of Ray Bradbury's science fiction stories and uh, from EC Comics, reprinted. And, but there's no introduction that says that's what they're from, as far as I remember. But the cover's by um, Frank Frazetta, who became one of the great science fiction artists. But he'd been drawing for EC Comics in the 50s and then became a, a huge artist in the 60s and 70s. And, uh, you know, and you probably know him from the artwork he did for Co the Conan books or for the Edgar Rice Burroughs books or many other things they did. he did. He was terrific. Um, I mentioned Wrinkle in Time before. Here's that book in a, in a first edition paperback from the early 60s. This is Way Station. I mentioned Clifford Simak won the Hugo for a time travel. Well, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting story, and you can, I recommend it. You can read it. It's a really interesting story. It's not time travel, but it's about this way station on Earth where you can travel to other worlds and so forth. Now, at the same time, uh, I mentioned some of the British writers. John Wyndham had, had risen to prominence with... Uh, uh, novels in the 50s into the 60s, The Day of the Triffids, um, 
uh, short story collections and the Kraken Wakes and uh, many cool things. And he was also being adapted into BBC adaptations of his work. Chalky is another novel of his that's quite, quite good. And it's about a kid whose imaginary playmate is actually a creature from another world and uh, that no one else can see or hear. And that's very, very fun. And Ray Bradbury also did an, a version of that kind of story, uh, an alien invasion story called Zero Hour that was done uh, in, in, in a short story form, in a, in, a, in a radio version that was very good, in an EC Comics version, and also in a television version on, on the Hitchcock show. So, um, so these stories were kind of promulgating, and everyone was writing and, and being influenced by everyone else's work, and there was a really interesting flow going on, and the Brits and the Americans were reading each other as well. So another writer who rose to prominence in the early 60s was J.G. Ballard, and uh, he was a very interesting guy. He, when he was a kid, he was kept in a Japanese internment camp with his family, and 